looks very similar to that helix, but not quite. Let me tip you off a little bit about a helix. What happens is one of your components is the variable itself, and the other two components, if I cover up the T here, are sine and cosine of that third component. That would be a helix in some direction. We throw in an extra T, that changes it slightly, not a whole lot. Well, if we had some time, I think we're running a little short now, Certainly, I would suspect you'd fill out a table like this. You've got a calculator. You can sit there and do it better than I. Figure it out in degrees or radians, whatever you're, uh, at this point, we're not taking derivatives, so I don't care how you sketch things, perhaps. Uh, continue on in that fashion. What you're supposed to do is eventually hit 90 degrees. And at that particular instant, the point in question would be pi over 2 sine of pi over 2. for the x-coordinate, pi over 2 cosine pi over 2 for the y, and just pi over 2 for the z. So the point in question is pi over 2, 0, pi over 2. Let me throw you, again, the little device I used for the helix, kind of threw a couple of you by listening to your questions. Because there's a sine and cosine there, what I might say is consider Pythagorean rule. It might tell you something. For example, if I add the, the squares, we'll get t squared sine squared plus t squared cosine squared. Of course, that just resolves it down, itself down to t. Now, what that says to me is the fly's shadow in the xy plane is a spiral. Now, why does it tell me that? Well, let's just graph that part of it. Here's the shadow. Okay, we can probably do this pretty well without going through an elaborate uh, table. If t equals zero, which is probably where I'm interested mostly, we're at the origin. If t equals one, okay, um, I have to include this as well. X equals t sine t, y equals t cosine t. If t equals one, we're still on this particular thing here, where x squared plus y squared equals 1. More specifically, if you plug in here, we're at sine 1, cosine 1, wherever that is. But it's going to be something like that. I'm just going to make up some of these numbers. If you put t equals 2, you get x squared plus y squared equals 4. That would be a point on a circle of radius 2 at sine 2, cosine 2. So that's going to look something like this take my word for it. I'm not filling in all the details, but it works out something like that. And this is very crude, but nonetheless, what you'll find is that the shadow of the fly spirals out in that fashion. Now, again, if we had more time, we could sit here with your calculators and plug in lots of numbers, but I, I feel if you do it, you'll find that this is basically what's going on. Now, this is the shadow, don't forget. What about the fly himself? Well, he or she is gaining altitude directly as a function of t by the function t itself. If it's t squared, going up faster, 
If it's minus t, the fly is dropping altitude, etc. Lots of things can happen. But what happens then is at t equals zero, the fly is literally at the origin. At t equals one, the fly is up here one unit above that shadow, then two units, three units, four units, etc. It's like a helix, except that rather than follow around a, a cylinder, the fly is following around a spiral, kind of a three-dimensional spiral out here. Okay, it's, and it's a, a tough figure to try to draw. What we are supposed to do, though, is not draw it so much, but actually investigate some of the algebra. So let's make a, a rough sketch. From the sh shadow picture over here, I claim the path for the fly may look something like this. And let's just stop it right here at t equals pi over 2. The reason I stopped it there is because the point in question had coordinates pi over 2, 0, and pi over 2. In other words, there's a shadow right at t equals pi over 2. So there's that lifting spiral I was talking about. What we're supposed to do is investigate r prime at pi over 2. Well, r prime, better copy r down again. R prime is going to have to use some of your fancy calc 1 product rules, but that's about it. If you plug it in there, for the component of I, product rule says it's 1 sine t plus t cosine t times I. Similar for the second one, 1 cosine t minus t sine t for J. And the derivative for K is just 1. K component has derivative 1. So there's the general derivative. What about specifically at pi over 2? Sine of pi over 2? You tell me. What's sine of pi over 2? 1. How about cosine? 0. So we'll get just 1 out of that thing, 1i. How about for the j component? The cosine is 0. The sine is 1. Looks like a minus pi over 2j. and just a plain k. We'll always have a k there. So it's a little bit tough to do up here, but let's give it a, a shot. It says, at, from this point, move one unit in the positive x direction. That's 1i. Move back pi over 2 units. Uh, that's about 1.7, something like that. And move up one unit k. That's kind of hard to believe, but that's supposed to be the vector that I just told you about. That should be r prime at pi over 4. And that should be tangential to the curve. And, as we'll find out next time, it should also be, in length, the speed of that particular particle. That particular instant, the length of that vector should be the speed. So one more time, here's i. Add to it a minus pi over 2 j. Add to that a k. In your old parallelogram law rule, and that vector sum should be that tangential vector to the curve at that particular point. Okay, I'm just going to throw out one last notion and maybe we'll take a closer look at it next time. I've seemed to be stuck on Calc 1 material. How about Calc 2? That's where we are now. What did you do mostly this semester? Integrals, same thing's true for vectors. You can talk about a definite integral of a vector function. And the rules are basically just the same. Using our same notation, it would be that component, a number. This component gives you the second number. And lastly, the last component look like this. And just like your fundamental theorem, if you happen to know a capital R whose derivative is little r, 
then you can write this down as well. If you have an antiderivative for little r, then you can evaluate your integral that way. Now, for example, back in early Calc 2 here, we often took distance function derivative to get velocity, which is basically what we just did here. And in integrals, we then took velocity functions, took their definite integral in order to find distance. That's basically the other dual track that we'll talk about a little bit here. So you can do it either way. I wish you will read at least the first two sections and perhaps just look at the pictures and skim over the third section. It talks about motion acceleration. I'll try to outline what's there. Again, give you a few more problems. We'll see you next time then.